Well, good afternoon and welcome to another session of History Sandwiched In. Uh, today we are fortunate because our speaker is Virginia Terry Boyd, who's a professor of design studies at UW. And um, she's going to speak to you about Frank Lloyd Wright, how his ideas were, were made into his art and architecture. So please welcome to History Sandwiched In, uh, Professor Boyd. Um, thank you for coming today. This is a big day in our history, and uh, it's actually rather difficult to, to be on a podium right after you've all heard, or many of you have heard, Barack Obama. So I'm going to do my best to, uh, uh, to follow his, his wonderful example. Um, today we're going to talk about uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, but not so much from the point of view of his architecture, but ideas behind it, concepts behind what emerges in form. And what is really interesting to me is how a person t moves from ideas into something quite physical. Uh, the title of the presentation is Frank Lloyd Wright, Designing an American Way of Living. Uh, when we speak of the house, I think most of us automatically think of the home. Our definition of home includes the myriad ways that we come to inhabit spaces and implies our unique world of things, of behaviors and activities that are constructed mostly for ourselves, for our comfort and for our psyche. Uh, the home is, is not just a place, but it is a way to be. And those are terms that, that Wright used. A, way, a home is a way to be. This concept of home uh, and house may be so familiar to us as to be uh, unremarkable in many ways, but it developed over time, and Wright devoted considerable thought to understanding how to translate the idea of a way of living into actual physical form and in a uniquely American way. These are his words. I think organic architecture should begin in the American home, the homes in which our American people dwell. There is the place where this idea of something integral of life and not on it begins. In his organic architecture, he shaped a vision of a contemporary ideal, and his vision remained remarkably consistent over the five decades of his career and remained relevant even as American society changed in funda fundamental ways during that period. We're going to explore ways that Wright moved back and forth between his ideas about an appropriate way of living for American families and how those ideas should be transformed into the physical design of houses. I think that there are three characteristics that were integral and constant to his ideal home for Americans. First, was a thoroughly modern house that had an entirely new arrangement of interior space responsive to new patterns of living. Secondly, the new house form expressed the new era through a new modern aesthetic, breaking away from past styles. And lastly, the new house form had to be accessible to all essential in a truly democratic society. And I want to go through those three uh, areas, those three characteristics uh, uh, in a little more depth. Uh, first, the, uh, the new approach to uh, space. Wright's early houses in the 1890s through 1950 that we now know as uh, the prairie houses proposed fundamental changes in the designs from the standard late Victorian house, such as the house on the left, contemporary to those that Wright was building, his house, Roby House, on the right, particularly in the allocation and arrangement of interior space. Victorian houses adapted architectural styles, predominantly European in origin, such as Tudor and Gothic and uh, uh, Italianate. Interior space was divided into layers horizontally, beginning with the basement, main floor, more private floors above, and uh, the attic. Uh, further compartmentalization was obtained by dividing each floor into increasingly smaller rooms 
devoted to highly specialized functions and activities such as butlers, pantries, libraries, sewing rooms, parlors, uh, kitchens, uh, servants' rooms, and many, many uh, more. Such spatial distinctions reinforce less visual but powerful social and role distinctions. The family occupied spaces separate from servants. Parent spaces were separate from children's. Women's and men's spaces were demarcated. Wright responded by rethinking such ill-fitting uh, house plans with his belief that architecture was principally about the shaping of space rather than conf configuring the form that enclosed it. It's not surprising that in rethinking the design of a house form, he would begin with a fundamental reshaping of the interior space of the house. He sought to reduce social and role distinctions to support less prescribed and looser, more informal interactions befitting American life, less bound by rigid class, social, gender, and generational divisions. Therefore, he allocated the majority of the interior space to a single expansive living space conceived as the heart of the house, the symbolic hearth of the family. It was to serve multiple and overlapping functions, including living, dining, intimate reading and conversation, and festive public entertaining. He described this space in the following way. As big a living room with as much vista and garden coming in as we can afford, with fireplace in it and, and open bookshelves, a dining table in the alcove, benches and living room tables built in, a quiet rug on the floor, convenient cooking and dining space adjacent to, if not part of, the room. Use of this central space was intended to be flexible, adapted to activities of the moment. Private space for bedrooms and baths and specialized service areas, including kitchen and storage, were much more compact in size. This approach, to begin with a large open space and organize diverse activities and flexible zones within it, would be considered novel much later in the 1950s, though Wright had, be, had by then been using it for almost uh, 50 years. Glass was critical to Wright's new approach to space. The, the material provided Wright to connect the house with, to him, one of the most potent forces of nature, light. To a great extent, light permitted his goal of opening up the enclosed volume of space defined by the exterior walls of then contemporary houses and integral interior uh, uh, rooms closed with walls and ceilings. His early houses, such as the Edward Boynton House on the left and the Hannah House uh, later, from later on the right, give indication of the ways Wright would extend his experimentation with light and glass uh, in the future. The heretofore box that delimited the space of a room was abandoned and replaced with a composition of vertical and horizontal planes of glass alternating with narrow, narrower solid panels, virtually eliminating the traditional wall. And panels of indirect artificial light on the ceiling eliminated a flat enclosed effect, opening the upper area of the room. As large floor to ceiling panels of glass became readily available, the material realized Wright's goal of an uninterrupted connection between the spaces of the interior and that of the natural world outside. Over the years, Wright continued to clarify his vision for an ideal American house form. The fundamental ideas about interior space remained intact, but refined to an essence. Wright named the distillation the Usonian House, after Usonia, his name for the United States, saying, the house must be a pattern for more simplified and at the same time more gracious living, necessarily new, suitable to living conditions as they might so well be in the country we live in today. Overall, the refinements focused even more on a more sense, single central space for living. 
A masonry core containing the fireplace was expanded to include all mechanical systems for the house and plumbing for kitchen and bath and heating. Thus clustering those rooms together in the middle of the house, reducing construction costs and leaving livable space facing outside walls. As many of the furnishings as possible were constructed of the building within it, further enlarging livable space, reducing or eliminating the buildup of clutter. Wright was ingeniously creative at blurring the boundary between building structure and functional furnishings in order to enlarge that central space of the house, the location of most daily activities. Uh, the second characteristic of his transition of ideas into uh, actual form was a modern aesthetic. Wright's intellectual concepts about an ideal house for Americans had to be translated into decisions about how the house should look. How does one go from the desire for a sense of beauty to a color for the wall? In his book, titled The Natural House, Wright describes this as the application of a grammar to the house, applying a constant character for all of the elements, the shapes, the colors, the textures, the patterns that can articulate an overarching architectural idea. These are the words that when combined according to principles of grammar, in this case the architect's idea, permit the house to speak in a language understandable and appealing to the client. For Wright, an unwavering requirement of his language was that it be composed of a limited set of elements used throughout all parts of the project, from the shaping of the landscape through the organization of the space of the house, the patterns of the glass and the fabric and the furnishings themselves. Wright avoided the term decoration to describe this language of form, preferring instead either integral pattern or organic uh, ornament to emphasize that the visual character was the structure manifested in all of its uh, parts. The style, though, even though he wouldn't use that term, the style of Wright is abstract largely devoid of pictorial representation, subject matter, or, or motifs. It is a vocabulary of pure, linear, geometric forms. And most important, as an abstract language, was a look that it expressed a new modern world. And that world was increasingly using the language of abstraction as its form of expression. Uh, think just uh, immediately of the actual the art movement of abstract expressionism. Uh, it is that same uh, uh, power of abstraction that was sweeping through uh, American culture, cultural forms at the time. Certain materials and objects brought Wright's innate sense of visual enrichment, all using the same aesthetic vocabulary. Uh, examples such as the patterning of light, both natural and artificial, uh, in light screens uh, such as these. And at this point, uh, notice that this is how he, he creates the pattern within stained glass and uh, that particular uh, material. And the effect of it, a very rich, visual rich material, uh, visu visually rich uh, effect. Uh, this is the way he would uh, create a very similar effect, a, w a whole wall of pattern, essentially, and light, uh, but in a very inexpensive way. This is done with plywood, two pieces of plywood that are cut with an abstract pattern, a, a piece of glass put in between them, and then that mounted in the wall. Uh, and on the right, I think you see the effect that the whole wall literally now is a pattern of uh, light very similar to the stained glass of earlier in his life, but now done in a much more economical, uh, but very effective way. 
uh, light fixtures themselves were opportunities for the modern uh, aesthetic. And very often the light fixtures, you really have to see them on. And if you have an opportunity, always ask if you could turn them on. Because very often the light shines through a pattern on, that's part of the fixture so that the pattern is uh, reflected on the floor or the ceiling or the wall uh, around that fixture. The pattern moves through uh, with the light into the, the room as a whole. Decorative accessories of various different kinds of metals, uh, materials provided opportunities for this new aesthetic. Uh, on the left, one of his iconic uh, pieces, a, a tall slender vase, uh, originally made in copper. And uh, in this case, these very uh, sleek, elegant, uh, attenuated uh, concave surfaces. Later, he would come back to that form uh, on the right in, in uh, wood. And in this case, the, the sleek, uh, concave surfaces have now changed to this much more sort of crisp, faceted, crystalline kind of effect. Uh, but the linear element is really very similar in two very different materials with very different uh, uh, characteristics. Uh, uh, furnishings were uh, another uh, opportunity for uh, the introduction of this new uh, aesthetic. Um, and again, though, the furnishings were integral to the whole, so I put a, a chair within not the context that it was originally designed for, but another house, and I think you could just see how you could move this chair easily into that space. The look, the structural uh, basis for it is just so consistent. Uh, chairs were a wonderful opportunity for uh, experimenting with this new visual vocabulary. In this case, in the back of the chair, with this very simple pattern, but very visually strong pattern of repeated vertical spindles that just have a terminus on the top uh, and the bottom that give a very strong visual effect, a decorative effect, which is, uh, again, a term he would hate to use, uh, uh, but the, the visual coming through that uh, structure very uh, strongly. This for me is just a, a wonderful example of this just incredibly organized, integrated way that the structure and the visual effect expressed, were one and expressed this new modernism. This is the David Wright House in, in uh, Scottsdale and you see a plan for it uh, on the right. Uh, the, the basic element of the design is clearly a circle and there's just nothing in this, uh, this house that does not reflect, interpret, uh, expand, enhance that design. And for me, the sort of the wonder of this is when you look at the plan, look at the colored penciled areas, that's the carpet for the house. And so from the very beginning of this design, the carpet was uh, clearly in his mind. He had it completely uh, worked out, uh, integral to, as important to him as the structure itself. And this is the final uh, uh, implementation uh, of that, um, almost an homage to a circle uh, in, uh, in many ways. So all of the materials and the objects in the structure provided forms to shape and surfaces to enhance his new visual language of geometry and line, a new language for uh, the modern uh, period. The last characteristic uh, is, I think, particularly important, and that was his commitment throughout his career that uh, uh, his design, this house for America, uh, Americans, be accessible to everybody. From the very beginning, he was committed to designing a moderately priced house. It was consistent with his view that a truly democratic America should make opportunities and advantages available so that everyone could reach their full potential, including access to a modern living environment. As the century progressed and rapid, the, the rapid growth of the middle class changed American society in multiple fundamental ways. The sheer size of this group gave individuals within it power to affect social change. This population was potentially receptive to Wright's ideas, believing that the home was a supportive refuge and place of comfort and particularly leisure. 
Somehow, though, Wright had to get his ideas to this wide uh, body of individuals. And he adopted several strategies which were not often used by, uh, some of which were not often used by uh, major architects, which he was at the time. Uh, he used frequent articles about his work in uh, home magazines and ladies' magazines. He illustrated uh, his ideas in temporary exhibition houses, uh, and he designed manufactured home furnishing uh, products. And we're going to look at each of those uh, individually. In their early history, women's home magazines were influential voices in the discussion of social and politi political issues of the day, discussing housing reform, women's rights and domestic reform, health and nutrition, the effects of urbanism, and industrialization. As they evolved, as the magazines evolved, the focus shifted to the more intimate domestic scene in terms of topics, uh, the area of interest, intense interest of right. Early in his career, Wright worked with Ladies' Home Journal, and these are two issues from 1906 and 1907, quite early in his career. And you notice on the left, uh, this is one of the first major, major meaning, wide exposure introduction of the ideas of the Prairie House uh, to the American public in this very uh, widely subscribed to uh, magazine. Uh, on the right is, uh, uh, you, you see this, this idea right in the headlines, a uh, small house with lots of room in it, and that lots of room is that main living uh, space. That's how he got that sense of expansiveness that uh, he wanted. The architect had a more involved relationship with the magazine House uh, Beautiful, particularly after World War II. Then editor Elizabeth Gordon, who you see here, was as passionately committed to making available to her readers the best and most current ideas in housing as Wright was committed to designing such, to creating such designs. The most extensive collaboration was evident in the November 1955 issue, which you see here, dedicated to Wright. Beginning with a cover photograph of Wright's house, Taliesin, uh, near here. And the cover legend reads, Frank Lloyd Wright, his contribution to the beauty of American life. And the issue emphasized living, not architectural style. The architectural style was in support of this broader idea. Uh, and in it, Wright shared his own way of uh, uh, living uh, with, his, with the readers. But Wright needed ways to make it possible for a larger number of individuals to actually experience his principles of organic architecture firsthand. An early attempt was the American system-built houses developed by Wright and the Milwaukee Arthur L. Richards Company. The company was to manufacture, service contractor, and distributor of the houses designed as prefabricated systems with some parts pre-assembled at the factory and some pre-cut and assembled on site. But the project never gained the necessary momentum, uh, uh, although there was an elaborate prom promotional effect, including the lithographed ad advertisement that you see on the left and its use in a full-page advertisement in the, Chicago, uh, uh, the Sunday Chicago Tribune in 1917. And again, notice the headline for the advertisement, which reinforces his idea that he's trying to provide uh, 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 something uniquely American, and you too, all of us, have access to it. He's not saying buy a Frank Lloyd Wright uh, a home. Another approach to get his ideas about an American house out to average people was a temporary exhibition house which permitted even more people to actually experience such a space, with the message again that it was something to which they could aspire. The most widely known exhibition house was included in the exhibition 60 Years of Living Architecture, the work of Frank Lloyd Wright, which opened in New York City in November 1953 on the site of the upcoming Guggenheim exhibition, which Wright was in the process of designing. In the late 1950s, 
Then in his 80s, Wright began an entirely new approach to forwarding his ideas about American living to the public through manufactured, mass-produced, home furnishing products. Wright worked with three manufacturers to develop products for the home, all coordinated across the manufacturers, which was uh, difficult to do, and named the Taliesin line. Wright's intent was to give the buyer the means or the tools in the form of furniture, fabrics, wallpaper, and paints with which to create an organic space within the confines of an existing non-organic space or basically a, a box. Uh, first, the, the Heritage Henry Don uh, furniture, which you see here. Uh, recognizing that most individuals were likely going to continue living in a box, he designed furnishings in such a way that the furniture would become essentially the structural architectural elements with which to build an organic space and organizing it into the flexible functional areas that he was doing in uh, the full uh, houses. Um, and you can see this, I think, a little bit. Uh, I couldn't show you the sort of the whole range of the Heritage Henredon line, but it was basically what we would now call modular furniture, of pieces that you could configure and reassemble all that were designed to work uh, together. So you could build essentially walls of cabinets and shelves uh, that would divide up space, would, uh, would create uh, functional um, areas. And you see one of those pieces in uh, the background. Uh, and you also see in the foreground uh, the dining room set, which is very reminiscent of those early in his career, but with some major changes. Uh, a wider, deeper seat, it's upholstered now, and a, the chair back is a little softer in its line, uh, also upholstered. Uh, uh, Heritage Henredon uh, was uh, uh, wanting to sell and knew what the market uh, needed and wanted, and so uh, uh, worked with Wright and, and Taliesin in, in making those kinds of changes. The second manufacturer was F. Schumacher and Company, at, uh, uh, prominent uh, textile manufacturer. Uh, many of the fabrics in the Taliesin line uh, were intended as drapery, creating and intended to create literally floor to ceiling uh, installations, which were meant to essentially open up that wall uh, through pattern and color. And I think if you, you can see that desired effect up here. Think back now to the stained glass windows where you had this, this wall of pattern. And here's that same idea, that the drapery wall, the walls of drapery created an illusion of the interior space expanding beyond uh, the wall. Uh, these are some of the other textiles that were part of the uh, Taliesin uh, line. The last manufacturer was Martin Senor Paints. Uh, which provided the means through paint to integrate the furnishings, the textiles, and the surrounding uh, wall surfaces through the element of color. So the three products together, again, were the tools in which uh, an average person could uh, create as much as possible an, an organic space within uh, a box. Uh, it's kind of hard to see the, the Martin Senior paints uh, because they're translated now through a number of different technologies. But I think on the upper left, you see some of the more sort of organic uh, colors that we associate with right. But look at the rest of the palette. Here are olive greens and aquas and, and oranges, the colors of the 50s. I mean, this was a real attempt to bring these ideas, to market them into uh, the everyday average uh, American. House Beautiful Magazine, again, uh, uh, worked with Wright uh, in uh, bringing these ideas to the American market. Uh, they had a, a special edition of the uh, magazine uh, devoted uh, to him and showing off all of the new products and how they might be used. This is one page uh, from that. Was Frank Lloyd Wright's 
approach to the design of an American house that provided sustenance to the soul, not just a fashionable house, successful? Providing a new approach to space in relation to new ways of living, a new modern aesthetic, and an attempt to make it available to everyone. Perhaps each of us must answer this question. Following Wright's death in 1959, House Beautiful composed another special issue dedicated to Wright, and this was their answer. Your legacy from Frank Lloyd Wright, a richer way of life. Thank you. sort of became interested in this uh, idea. And I, th I tried to sort of show that here in that uh, early in his career, he was working with Ladies Home Journal. You know, that's 1906. And you know, as I followed through the houses and, and, and his, his writings, this idea is consistent all the way through. You know, there were periods when the, the public buildings were the major commissions, but even during that time, you still heard him committed to this goal of his, which became almost a, well, not an obsession, but just an in incredible sustained commitment that he wanted to provide the average person, and I know it sounds like such a cliche, you know, but that it, it just really, uh, it was part of him all the way through. Sometimes because of commissions, it didn't appear as much, but uh, I, I, I think it was there all the way through. Yeah. About the furniture, uh, I know the word organic comes up a lot, you used it, you were using it. And, but some of that furniture does not, I, when I think of organic furniture, I think of like a lazy boy. Like, that's <laughs> it's good for the organism. Uh, <laughs> good for the organism. <laughs> uh, so much of this, this furniture just looks uncomfortable to me. Was it? Or, or what well, was see, it? Well, you have to you have to remember that this individual lived it, his career was developed within the Victorian period. And he died in the 1950s. And you have to just think of the huge changes in the way people lived, operated during that time. When he came in, when he, he came into to his architectural practice, think of the way women in particular were dressed. They were dressed in corsets. They would not stand the way I'm standing. I mean, they would stand with much better posture and posture that was very delimited in terms of its movements. You needed furniture that accommodated that kind of, you know, men were in very stiff collars. They were always uh, uh, dressed in very formal ways. At home, that opened up a little bit, uh, relaxed a little bit, but it was a very formal lifestyle. So, you know, I think if you gave them a, a lazy boy, that would have been, um, uh, they would have had, uh, been, been very e uneasy uh, about it because the, the mannerisms, the, the way they lived was a much more formal life. I think they would have felt very uncomfortable, you know, slouching the way, uh, the way we do. Um, but what, uh, when you looked at the Heritage Henredon pieces, and that was also why I was sort of commenting that, you know, those were wider and deeper and, and upholstered, and this is the 1950s now, and we're in this, we're, no, we're in Ames, and, and that, that, I think the Lazy Boy was there at that point or something very similar to it, and things have changed, and he's changing. And if you look at his furniture in the 1950s, particularly that that's built in, it's low, it is, is wide, it's deep, 
Um, coffee tables are now part of it. You know, the center of gravity for his design, his furniture, is much more consistent with Lazy Boy. Um, I never saw Lazy Boy in, in, in if he is something similar to that. But uh, I think he was more attuned to, you know, I, keep, I would say he had antenna out there on how people like to live. And I think he was amazingly adaptive as times changed. Yeah. You mentioned that uh, the, the, the main space was very large and, the, mm -hmm. and then the bedrooms, bathrooms, and kitchens were very small. And as I recall, the kitchen at Taliesin is like mm -hmm. minute. Mm -hmm. um, didn't women rebel or? You know, you know early, early on, there were servants in the house, in these houses. You know, so the women weren't rebelling because they had help, you know. Uh, but as the, you know, as this, this way of thinking about the space developed, and in the quotation that I gave you, remember, he was talking about the kitchens and the eating area being part of that space. And, you know, I think we think about it now sort of the great room where, you know, we have dining and you can see into the kitchen. I mean, the kitchen is just part of that large space. And that was really the idea. Uh, and there, I mean, there's a whole larger issue of sort of changing roles and expectations that women have during this period, which are going, undergoing fundamental changes. And you know, again, though, I think this this architecture was not so much behind the ball, the ball in terms of moving from uh, very cons conscribed um, kitchens that were separate to smaller spaces for kitchens, but those spaces were part of this larger, more informal ho whole. And it was the woman that was then, the, the wife, the mother, who was in that kitchen. Mm -hmm. There was another hand. Yeah, I wonder just how commercially successful his furniture line was. The furniture, you know. Yeah. Well, It, yes, it was a little more expensive, uh, depending on one's means, a lot more expensive. Um, the, one of the reasons that, okay, first of all, the furniture didn't sell very well. Textiles sold the best. Um, paints, mm, you know, anyone could use the paints, so it's kind of hard to tell, you know, whether they were buying Frank Lloyd Wright paints or because they liked a particular color in general. Um, one of the reasons the furniture didn't seem to sell was that because it was modular, um, to see how it worked, you had to have it all together in a showroom. And if you think about the way department stores in the late 40s and 50s laid out departments, laid out furniture, they put all the chairs for all the manufacturers in one space, and they put the tables here, and they put the case pieces here. So you couldn't really see how this all sort of worked together. Um, and it looked, uh, Scandinavian modernism was just coming in, and so you know, we didn't really have a lot of experience with that kind of modularity. Uh, but it was a little bit more expensive. Uh, I tend to think that's probably why the, the fabric sold better, because if you couldn't afford the furniture, but you wanted something of rights, you could afford uh, a yardage of, of, of fabric, and you could do something um, with that. Uh, but in general, I think it was kind of ahead of its, its time. And uh, I mean, some of the fabric, because the intent of it was to create these big walls of uh, fabric, those are really large repeat patterns. And you can't do an awfully lot with, I mean, you can't make dresses out of that. Um, you know, so it was kind of conscribed um, too. Thank you for coming. <laughs> University Place is made possible in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting.